welcome back to all remote centers yes we'll start the interaction now uh, rc1132 sri padampat singhania university uh, good evening thank you for three days session a uh, couple of question context where uh, in all private engineering colleges nowadays uh, uh, don't have freedom to set up their own question to evaluate the students like west bengal wbut is there up uptu is there then uh, in rajasthan rtu is there in this con context uh, we all also see students have problem sometimes you know some deserving students don't get good score and some uh, average students also get higher score uh, because of this assessment issue what is your take second uh, i really like this uh, model that's a flipped classroom and i started using it but the realistic fact that is somewhat different than um, the, what we, we are actually trying to implement so that students understand better but uh, realistic fact is that uh, students only uh, when comes for uh, you know exam purpose then only they uh, look into these videos i personally have some videos uploaded for the students for different courses so looking into this uh, so what's your say actually thank you sir uh, okay so i'll take the second question first which is on uh, students are not looking at the flip classroom videos before they come to class and they look at it only before the exams so one of the things that is commonly done by you know um, flip classroom instructors is that they sometimes have a small quiz at the start of every class which test them on some recall or uh, understand level questions of the content in the video that they were supposed to have seen so that ensures that the student has actually seen the video and is not simply coming to the class for the activities and you know wasting your time and other students time by asking questions which are already been addressed in the flip classroom video the second thing is that if you keep these videos short enough you can in fact also intersperse some activities in the video itself like for example today's flip classroom session that you saw it was actually one video with some activities interspersed in between so similarly if you say in the video itself if you say pause here do this now that will also help to keep the students very engaged instead of giving them a 30 minute video to just look at like a movie from the starting to the end uh, coming to the first question about assessment not being in the instructor's control that's a very valid problem and uh, really it's not something that can be solved within the scope of uh, a workshop like this i mean it has to be taken up at various levels aict levels and all and there are people who are doing that and um, for the present moment what we can uh, recommend is that if your students buy into the fact that look this will also help them to get good marks in the exams in the traditional exams then they win in both the ways so that is something that you can uh, tell them regarding this issue of assessment something that almost all colleges have is that the instructor has uh, some percentage of marks for internal assessment and it's somewhere between 20 and 30 depending on the college and university so that's also one place where you as an individual instructor can implement these activities and give assessment questions that are aligned to your activities magdum college of engineering good evening uh, madam i wanted to know how to evaluate the performance level in a rubric i'm not sure Uh, exactly what you're trying to ask the question was how to evaluate performance levels in a rubric so if you recall the morning session we discussed that a rubric has various performance levels and the example that you saw had four performance levels starting from the desired or target performance going down in terms of lower levels of performance so as a teacher you you define what are the different levels of performance and when a student makes a presentation or shows a project you match what the student has done that is you match the student's performance to the closest level within the rubric uh, es college bhopal the question is that how we can uh, judge a video which is going to be shown in the class whether the students are gaining uh, how much uh, uh, they are gaining from that particular video So I think uh, you're talking about a flipped classroom where the students see the video outside and you want to see what the students learned. So this is exactly what uh, a few minutes ago was explained. 
One way you can assess students on what they learned from a video is to give them a short quiz or some question, assessment question at the beginning of the following class, which is exactly based on the video. And this activity or this assessment can be kept at a simple or medium level. It doesn't have to be very complex. And it mainly tells you whether A, the student has watched the video, and B, how much he or she has learned from the video. So a quick example to that is the peer instruction and think pair share videos that we had uh, in our Moodle. So with each video, there were associated questions which were not too complex. So it was simple which you can attempt after the watching the video. So make sure that you tie some sort of assessment uh, along with the videos when you give it to the students. Geetam University, Hyderabad. Uh, my question is on flipped classroom. Actually, how far this flipped classroom is useful for a student of all the subjects in a day? That means uh, he should remember or memorize all the videos of the each and every subject and he should come to the college. And one more thing, if he addicted to the videos, what about the classroom scenario about the faculty? He never listened to the faculty then. So this uh, flipped classroom is useful for the laboratory or theory? We feel that it's most useful for the laboratory. So there are really no rules about whether the flipped classroom should be used for the laboratory or for the theory. If you find that it's more useful for the laboratory, you should feel free to go ahead and use it. So the only point that is being made about the flipped classroom is that we don't want to spend our time giving information to students in the classroom, which they can easily access by themselves. In the classroom, we want to spend time making sure that students are able to assimilate that information and work with that information. Okay, so coming to your uh, first question on you know which subjects and all, so it's basically a matter of explaining to the student that normally they come to class, they listen to lectures, they take homework, they go back home and they do the homework. Here, they are doing the homework first and then they are coming to class and doing what would have otherwise been the homework as in the class. So the total amount of effort, if you look at for the student, is the same in both the models. So it's only a question of which is being done first and which is being done later. And then coming to your second question of, you know, will it make the instructor redundant? I mean, that is something which we have been talking about in the session altogether, is that if the instructor's job, if you look at the instructor's job as simply passing on some information to the student, then yes, it will make your job redundant. If think of your job as not just passing on some information to the student, but helping the student to learn something or to apply something or make sense of something in context, and you design these activities for the student to carry out in the class after they have watched the videos, then there is no way that it can make you redundant. So the more you are able to contextualize the topic for the student, the more the students will be appreciating and coming to your class even though they may have watched your video earlier. As per assessment, we have the various factor. In the, our university curriculum, we have the very less time, suppose two to three months. So during that duration, how can you evaluate the individual student to assess the individually to the different? So. Uh, once again, I think this assessment question of assessment, how much percentage is held by the university and how much percentage is held by the individual instructor, that will vary from university to university. And all that you can try, see, it is not possible for us to change the entire educational system in, you know, one workshop or in, uh, you know, one decade even. So it's something that we can we only work on slowly. And what you can do is keep wherever you can make a change in your own assessment, in your own course, wherever you have the flexibility, you should go ahead and make that change. And wherever you cannot make the change, where it is uh, you know, dictated to you by the university or somebody else, you, know, you just have to live with it and we have to tell the students that look, even though the assessment is of that type, going through instruction, the way using active learning techniques and so on, this will be useful to you. So none of these workshops are meant to completely change everything. So these are all things that you can add on to your teaching learning, which will make your teaching learning more effective than simply transmitting information in the classroom. Mahalingam College. Good evening, sir. So this question is regarding the question of assessment. So learners with different intelligence levels will be in a particular class. 
and at what percentage each uh, bloom's level should be in uh, question paper well second the question paper the same thing and second question is uh, whether is there any difference between active learning and activity based learning the case of activity based learning uh, this uh, role play methodology yeah okay. so whether active learning and the activity based learning are related so my understanding of the first question is that we have students with diverse backgrounds diverse intellectual backgrounds diverse motivations and so on so how should we target our instruction and which blooms levels should we target in that case so what again this is a question which is of common concern to a lot of us this diversity issue is one of those challenging problems and there is really no one solution that addresses this Bloom's taxonomy. What it does is gives us one possible tool or one possible technique where we can think of questions. We can create questions at various levels, and then make sure that there is a variety of levels in the questions that we ask within the class and in the exams and so on. So Bloom's taxonomy does not tell us that for students of this level you must use the Bloom's questions at a certain level. the overall recommendation is still that do not concentrate only on recall and understand levels because if you look at most university exams today have primarily questions on recall and understand so the overall recommendation is that do look at all the levels because learning in science and engineering and other subjects is spread across all the levels so that's as much as we can recommend we also don't say that keep all questions at the create level that also defeats the purpose so for a suitable in a suitable context so if you have a group project if you have uh, presentations do ask questions like the kind that you wrote today morning in your tps activity if you have a written exam make sure you have a mix of all levels and and different students will be able to answer different questions so vaishnav institute of technology very good evening sir we want to ask from you what methodology a college can adopt so that the course curriculum for the students can best utilize their knowledge in the industry for designing a new product okay so this is again one of those broad questions to which there is no specific answer so it depends upon the course it depends upon the subject that you are teaching see as teachers we all agree that that is the grand goal that we want our students to achieve we want them to learn something that is very relevant and we want them to be able to apply it in the industry but there is no single answer to that question so you have to try it in your own way in your own course for example there are i can only give you some examples so one of the examples that when i teach networking is that sometimes when i see a problem in the industry i pose that same problem to the students so that they can get a feel of okay what are the problems that people in the industry are working on another thing that you could do is you could invite somebody from the industry to come and give a guest lecture in your course where again the students can get a feel of you know what is going on in the industry what are the problems how they become ready and so on so there really is no single correct answer to that you know give them problems let them do projects which are to the extent that is possible to the extent that you have the freedom that are relevant to building products in the industry and that's about it that's all that you can do roland institute good evening sir i am from roland institute barampur sir actually the time duration to complete the course is very less and the syllabus and the course contents are different uh, Indian technical universities found differ from one university to another university. So, in this context, how can we cover the course with video clipping? Okay. So, once again, so the question is about how to cover the entire course when we are doing video material or you know activities of this sort. So, see, it's one thing to think that we are covering the course when we are simply lecturing, okay, and it's another thing to for the students to actually acquire that material because. as many of you may also agree that students don't necessarily pay attention when we are simply lecturing so it may not be that so it's only our illusion which makes us feel that we are covering the material so in this case what you will find when you implement such techniques either using flipped classroom or any one of the active learning other active learning techniques is that you instead of the students you know listening to you in the lecture and then going back to their hostel or you no know, homes and you know studying in groups that entire studying is happening together so that is why the material that we are worried about as will not get covered actually does get covered because they are engaging with the material on a more day to day basis rather than just before the exam it's a matter of going ahead and implementing it 
and then you will realize for yourself that it does get covered. There seem to be a number of questions on flipped classroom on the chat. So let me just take a few of those questions right now. Uh, one of it says that using flipped classroom is difficult because students are coming from various economic backgrounds and maybe they don't have the resources in their homes to watch the videos. So in this case, one thing that some people have tried is to actually play the videos in the college itself and maybe for half the class itself. So as a teacher, if you're normally used to lecturing for one hour and if you already have access to some of these videos, maybe something that you have made in your previous years teaching or video that somebody else has created, you can play the video in the class for half the session and then do an active learning strategy for the other half. In fact, that's exactly how we've been running this particular workshop. That within the workshop, we've been playing videos and immediately doing active learning strategies. So that is one way you can overcome the resource problem. The other point that some people, th these are just comments or questions that which kind of students will flip classroom work? Will it be, is it only the high achievers or the low average students? Will it fail for some? And again, there are no rules here that flipped classroom only works for a certain kind of population. If the guidelines are implemented correctly, that is, pose a video, let students watch a video which is made well, according to the guidelines that was discussed today. Make sure that students have watched the video, either by means of a quiz or some short activity. And then give another activity where students are actually applying this content. This cycle should help all kinds of students. It's not about letting students watch the video and learning everything from the video itself. That's not the point of a flipped classroom. So, Nanamani College. In a derivative paper, like uh, as like in our electrical domain, you know. So, how we can use this activity tool, uh, like your uh, loomings and then your rubrics, how we can implement uh, this kind of tool, like a derivative paper and mathematical oriented paper. Uh, this is our first uh, doubt, sir. And then. Uh, the second is that, uh, so um, the most of the case we are uh, we are conducting the classes and then uh, it is going. The entire course is, course is depends upon the exam oriented. So if it is a exam oriented means how we can implement these activity tools uh, in such a kind of courses. So these are the two uh, queries from our side. Okay, so the first question is about how we can implement this in a mathematical concept. So this question was asked yesterday and answered yesterday. I think perhaps uh, let me just quickly recap. The point here is that in any of these strategies, the more as an instructor, if you go on telling, the less the students are going to listen to you. The more you come up with ideas for making the students do something in the class, the more they are going to be able to absorb the topic. So it does not matter whether, it is, whether you call it peer instruction or TPS or flipped classroom or whatever. Find ideas by which you can make students work in the class. That is the basic principle that you have to apply here. And that principle, you can use your own creativity to figure out how to apply that in a mathematical course. So for example, if you're doing a proof, you can do a few steps of the proof and then ask the students to do the subsequent steps of the derivation on their own, maybe do a think pair share activity, and then continue with doing the proof. So this is one way in which you could do that. School of Management, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, my question is, if we will use uh, this flipped class act, uh, technique in our class, the students may get uh, disinterested in traditional classes and they will not come for the performance based activities for the class and we will face absentee in class. So how we can overcome this issue in our classes? Okay, so this is again one of the questions which I answered just about 10 minutes ago. That is the concern, if you are not going to do anything more in your class than transmitting videos, than transmitting information, then yes, you have this threat that students may not come to your class. On the other hand, if we are going to do activities in the class, then definitely the students will come because we are going to give them the context of making that information. See, what we have to understand in the flipped classroom model is that it's not really a new, anything new that we are doing. All that we are saying is that if you look at the entire learning process, earlier it was that we were lecturing in the classroom and that had some reason because in the 20th century, the information was at a premium. Information was not very easily available to everybody. And so teachers were trained to provide that information to large number of students. So in the classroom, what we were doing was providing the information. 
and out of the classroom was when the students were working together in groups and you know uh, internalizing that information by solving problems and worksheets and so on whereas in the 21st century because so much of information is already available as youtube channels and various educational uh, videos what we are trying to do now is to help them internalize this information by doing the activities in the classroom so if you get this point across to the students that the reason for flipping the classroom is that what otherwise you have to do in the hostel or in your home without the instructor and the teaching assistant support now you can do in the classroom with the support and it makes your life easy then students are not going to stay away from the classroom there is only one condition one context in which what you say may be a little valid suppose in all assessments exams projects and in all assessments you only ask what's in the video then that's not a good situation for students because as you say the students might have less motivation to come to class but if students find out that what you're doing in class is useful to them in some way or the other it even for one situation let's say to do well in the group project they need to do the activities or to do some problem that you give in a quiz next week they need to do the activities in class then they'll come to class so when you have some when you are setting some question or giving an homework assignment make sure that they the questions cover both the video as well as the activities that are done in class truba college yes sir good evening sir uh, my question is how rubrics can be applied on uh, lab sessions and how to create a rubrics for student assessment thank you okay the question is how can rubrics be used for labs in fact rubrics are one of the good assessment techniques for labs because what you want to assess there do fall under multiple criteria and what you want to assess is sometimes more complex than what can be done with a single number what i'd suggest for labs is to try to identify the various criteria on which you want to assess students so some of these criteria may be that has the student uh, identified the correct principles to do the experiment have they uh, chosen the correct data values have they plotted the graphs correctly have they done the analysis have they done the implementation correctly so identify various criteria or categories over which on which you want to assess the student and create one rubric item that is one row in the rubric for each of these um, criteria if you want to look at some examples again i think if you look at google and say rubrics for labs on electronic circuits you might get quite a few existing examples but it's up to you as a teacher to decide which criteria are important for your students in your labs nri institute uh, good evening uh, we, we want to ask that uh, you know this uh, uh, to uh, when we create this uh, uh, for example uh, this resource is through screen cast uh, so normally i mean uh, the assumption uh, is like that uh, we need to have the resources at, uh, at our end or other student uh, should have this uh, uh set up where they can uh, use the resources so uh, perhaps you know uh, normally the assumption is like student can use those at their end also but uh, uh, i think the students are uh, sometimes uh, having constraint in terms of using our resources so uh, perhaps uh, uh, we uh, i mean as an institute uh, to make ict uh, more uh, knowledge worthy we need to i think uh, in the classrooms have those facilities uh, you know it facilities uh, to be fully enabled so this uh, i think is uh, we find it is a little bit of constraint as far as uh, making it you, uh, you know available to the wider audience as far as the student knowledge is concerned so i just wondering uh, i mean like uh, your views on this thing okay 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 so uh, the point is well taken that the resources are not available to all the students and it's possible that you are dealing with a target population who don't have access to the resources and the challenge here for you is to you know figure out a way to make them achieve the same amount of learning so the once again the point here is not on the specific technique or not on the specific resource that is being created what your i said is always on what is the student getting out of it and if you can figure out a way to get the students like something that we spoke about earlier that if students don't have access to the video you can play the video in the first 10 minutes of your class where you have a projector and you have access to the resources so in all of these techniques what i would like uh, all of you to keep in mind 
is that none of these are a single solution that can be applied for all topics, for all um, levels, uniform, for all types of students, in all types of demographics uniformly. So we are not giving you a solution here. What we are giving you is exposure to a set of different ways of doing things. And now it's up to you to decide which way suits you for your students. And so that is why the teacher is never going to become redundant. No, we can give these workshops, but you have to then think about, okay, what can I take from this workshop and apply in my own classroom to make my students learn more than what they were learning earlier. So that challenge is actually resting with you. There is no answer that we can give you ready-made for that question. One way you can begin to answer this question from what we did in the workshop is to see what we focused on. And right from day one, and in, in fact, right from our title, we've been focusing on the pedagogy and the techniques and the instructional strategies that form the principle of all the, of what you do in class. Uh, one good example of this was the polling questions. So in this workshop, we used AView poll, but we know that you don't have AView poll in your classes. So we discussed methods of doing polling in your classes. There again, you have a variety of options. You have clicker devices, if that's available. If you don't have it, you can use the paper and the four quadrants that we showed. If you don't even want to do that, you can use a hand raise. But the principle of using polling questions and getting students to discuss with each other remains the same for all of these tools. So when you go back and look at what you learned from the workshop, focus on these principles and these techniques that you learned and then try to translate it into your own context. College of Engineering, Bhubaneswar. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, can we use uh, TPS or peer instructions for evaluating the students? Can we use uh, these type of activities to categorize the students into different levels? It is generally recommended that these activities not be used to slot students into low, medium, high achievers and not to assign marks to these activities. And the main reason is you want the free student discussion to happen in the pair phase and in the peer discussion phase. Also in the think phase and when students are doing their own vote, you want them to actually think and learn and try to connect rather than be aware and be constrained by, oh, how many marks am I getting for this. So we really recommend that you don't use these strategies for giving marks and all the research studies that exist show that student learning definitely gets improved by these strategies when there are no marks associated with it. Mufakkam Ja College. Good evening. My question is that uh, we have already started implementing rubrics for our labs and uh, project seminars. Uh, but during assessments, we are facing a typical difficulty in the sense uh, we have to print out 60 pages of our rubric sheets for 60 students and then mark on each sheet and then give it back to the students, collect it back and feed it into our system. Is there a software that can help us out to do this since you are already showing a lot of good softwares to us? Is there a software for rubric assessment? Thank you. Uh, a quick and easy answer to this uh, will be you can put it in Google spreadsheets wherein it is visible to all the students and they will be able to post their markings in that. But the learning management system of Moodle actually has a facility wherein an activity can be created and you can access it through Moodle with both self and peer uh, review. We will be trying to use it in the coming phase to a minor extent because there is a diversity we will not be able to address it to enter every person but we will be using this particular module in Moodle called workshop wherein you submit your assignments and it has first undergo a self review then a peer review finally you will get uh, graded. So the quick and easy answers shared spreadsheets either in Google or some other mechanism but in a larger way, it is like you can use learning management systems which already has this facility. So you can also simply project the rubric onto the you know white board or whatever and that's that's a technique which I have used and simply say that this is the rubric and allow people to grade themselves or allow people to grade their peers submission using that. And then once you collect it back, you can always say that I'm going to randomly check and verify whether the grading has been done fairly and all that. So that's also a possibility. Uh, uh, 
global we don't know how to assess the openness of them. But uh, using this rubrics, we can now evaluate. Thanks for that one. And our, uh, one more thing is, uh, in the think pair share activity, uh, the people here are uh, thinking individually. And uh, pairing is not taking place among the faculty. And uh, as a coordinator, I try to try my best to, to share their views. But sharing is effectively not taking place. Uh, pairing is not effectively taking place, but uh, when I ask for the uh, ask them to share, they are sharing with the coordinator their views and other things. And uh, the effectiveness of the workshop is uh, only when they pair, it will be effective. So thanks for bringing this point to our notice that, um, see, it does happen that when people are not exposed to this methodology of think pair share there is a lot of reluctance in the beginning. So irrespective of whether you are doing a workshop for teachers or whether you are taking a class for 150 students or whether it's a class for 30 students, the first few times when they encounter this think pair share they always are diffident about talking to each other. So which is why the most of the pair faces you will notice have a specific deliverable which is different from the think face deliverable. So as a coordinator if you can bring that to the pairs notice and you know, it's, so as an instructor what I do in my class is simply walk around and simply encourage them to talk to each other and say that look have you achieved that deliverable which was given for the pair face. So for example in the morning's uh, session there might have been the pair phase deliverable of you know, look at activities that have been written and see whether they are of the appropriate uh, higher order uh, levels. So you could as a coordinator simply go around and encourage them to talk about that, you know, interact yourself with a few pairs and once there is a some amount of noise in the class, you will find that the pairs, other pairs also start interacting. And in the worst case, if none of this happens, then you know, there really is nothing to do. You can just say, I tried my best. Yeah, Perimal College. Uh, sir, uh, uh, in, the, in the previous session, you have discussed about teacher A and teacher B. Uh, that uh, teacher A can uh, discuss the thing in the classroom and uh, the problems can, can be solved in the, uh, as a homework. The teacher B, what he or she can do is, uh, uh, he can uh, uh, load the video and that video can be given to the student and he or she can see it in the home and come back by next morning and the uh, problem can be solved in the classroom. So, uh, so which way will be a, uh, a mathematical student? So I assume that the question is for teacher A and teacher B which is better for a mathematical student. So once again I cannot answer at the level of mathematics. It again depends upon the topic, it depends upon what your learning objective is. If your learning objective is simply for them to memorize some formula, then perhaps teacher, either of the teacher's strategies will work. So if your objective is for them to um, apply that formula in order to learn something, I think if you do the teacher B strategy and then follow it up with some more homework exercises, that might turn out to be the best. So once again, like I have been saying since the beginning, none of these are a single correct answer type of uh, solution. So this is one additional way. It's, it, just think of it as you have many tools in your toolkit to solve various problems. So we have only given you a few more tools with which you can attack problems that are happening in your classroom. So we cannot say that this one tool will solve all the problems. Depending upon your own subject that you are teaching, whatever mathematical uh, topic it might be, you have to think about the learning objective, you have to think about whether your assessment questions are, what your assessment questions are, whether they are matched with the learning objective and then decide what is a suitable instructional strategy for that particular topic. Uh, Sharad Institute of Technology. My question is, uh, from exam point of view, uh, how weightage should be distributed among the various level of community level, I mean, how many questions for recall level, likewise apply level. And a supplement question to it, uh, that uh, uh, how, uh, is, it, is it desirable to uh, apply a question, create level question in the theory paper? This is a question, the question is how many questions should be there in the exam at various Bloom's levels? 
And again, this is a point uh, we did not discuss too much in the workshop, but we did discuss it in one of the question and answer sessions, that in addition to creating questions at various levels and doing activities in class at various levels, the teacher has to make a decision independently on exactly this point. And that depends on your goals and it depends on what all you have done in class. There is a formal framework you can use. It's called a blueprint to do this. The blueprint just helps you determine how many questions for each topic at each level and for uh, different uh, types of questions, different format of questions, whether you want to give fill in the blank or essay and all. So you make a decision before you write a question paper that you want some distribution. The decision will depend on who your learners are, how much th you think they have learned during the classes, how, in what way you have taught them, what methods you have taught, what other assessment tools you have used. So it depends on a variety of factors that are completely in your control and whose information only the teacher knows. So again, there is no, I'm not giving you an answer to this question because there really doesn't exist a clear answer. There is only the recommendation that do not do only recall and understand level questions. And at the same time, it's not practical to do only evaluate and create level questions, even if we feel that that's what we want our students to do. So judiciously choose a mix of different levels so that the students can answer the paper in the given time and so on. Uh, regarding your second question as to can you give create level questions in an exam, it might be better to give it as a project or as a take home assignment depending on how extensive and how complex the create level question is. But it may be possible to write some restricted create level question. So you may give a question where they have to write a part of a program or design a part of a system. It may be possible to put this on a test but then make sure that the other questions are also uh, such that the students have enough time to answer this question. So uh, let me give you one example of uh, such a create level question which you can put in an exam. So once again here the amount of time that you give to the students will have to be flexible. You can't put create level questions and say that you have to create an answer within one hour. So if you have some amount of open ended time. So one question that uh, you know I often used to put in my uh, exams was that take all the topics that you have learned in this course and suppose you have to teach one of these topics to your grandmother. Okay, how are you going to teach the topic? So that's an example of a create level question which actually gives you a lot of idea about how much the student has themselves learned in the course or for that particular topic that they choose to write about. Keep in mind that these questions are very hard to evaluate. So if you are going to have 90 of such answers, each of those answers is going to take you a fair amount of time because you will need some kind of a rubric to evaluate a create level question. You cannot simply use a marking scheme in order to evaluate them. So given those constraints, it is possible to put such questions in even in exams. Rajaram Bapu Institute. Uh, actually in create level, is there any necessity that always to ask open ended question so again there is a fine line between create level and apply level so for example when you ask a student to write a program for let's say a, a queue of taxis at an airport okay let's say you're teaching a programming uh, course and you say that look i want to write a program which manages a queue of taxis at an airport now at one level it may be an apply level question at another level it may be a create level question but in both cases this is not an open ended question the question is fairly closed in the sense that the objective is clear. What is open ended is that there are multiple solutions that may be possible and there may be multiple correct solutions for this particular question. So that is the open ended part of most create level questions. It's possible for you to design the question in such a way that the requirements are clearly specified. But then the open ended part will still remain in the multiple paths that the different students take to answer the question. So the evaluation of such questions will necessarily need to account for these variations in their answers. This is a point uh, which has repeatedly come up. So let me just talk a little bit about the principle behind what it means to have a cognitive level or a thinking level of students and the activity itself. So if you're getting confused as to 
should this be the type of question I write for a certain level or what are the rules for writing a question at a certain level, I would suggest that you go back to the definition of what students should be able to do at that level. Look at the definitions of levels that were provided in the Bloom's taxonomy hierarchy and then look at your learning activity and see if the student has to do those tasks or in order to fulfill your activity. So if you want to ask is it an apply level problem, there must be some rule or principle that the student has to apply in a situation that is relatively new. So ask yourself if the learning activity satisfies that. At least it should begin to help you differentiate between the cognitive level and the activity itself. Yeah, so MEPCO college. So same question if we ask in the exam, will it come under same analyze category or it will come under understand category <laughs> or recall category? If I apply the principle that I just stated, what is the student doing in the exam to answer that question? Most likely it will be understand only or perhaps even recall as you mentioned. So think from what the student is doing in order to answer that question and you can make this decision. And we think it's going to be at a lower level if you repeat the identical question. On the other hand, if you do something which is related but new, the student might still need to do thinking tasks at least at the apply if not at the analyze level. Students who use rubrics, rubrics uh, during the learning process. Using means uh, where uh, they will use, madam. They will understand those rubrics or they have to apply it somewhere. Your question was where are students going to use rubrics? So where are students going to use rubrics? So the quick answer is rubrics will give them information as to how they are going to be assessed. So they will know what they have to perform to uh, satisfy pass criteria within that particular activity. So supposing it is a lab assignment, what should be an excellent category of uh, activities or experiments and what is not so uh, advised category of doing the tasks, this they will come to know by seeing the rubric in which they are going to be assessed. So, K.S. Rangaswamy College. Uh, our institution got accredited by NBA under Tier 1 category and also ours is an autonomous institution. We implemented outcome based education process in a full fledged manner. We have already little bit ex uh, expertise in writing program education objectives, course objectives and also we implemented various cognitive levels in assessment pattern. But we found that in an uh, exam the pass percentage is abysmally low, but we find one major difficulty in implementing these things for heterogeneous level of students. What should be the appropriate uh, proportion for various cognitive levels in setting the question paper? So uh, one quick answer to this is the you will have to decide a blueprint of question papers right at the start. But see one important thing is that your learning objective has to have an alignment with what you are assessing. So supposing you do all uh, and ultimately your instructional strategies have to be aligned with your learning objective and assessment strategies to make sure that your abysmal score turns into a good number. So if you go wrong at any one place, you cannot blame either setting up of learning objectives or setting up of questions uh, for your abysmal record. But a quick answer to your uh, question is in summative exams or end semester exams, you should not have too much higher order cognitive level questions because at the end of the day they are attempting the exam in a finite amount of time. So the cognitive level that they have to do uh, these tasks have to be matched with the time that they take for answering the questions. So make sure that you have at most one evaluate if not create and the other should be at apply analyze level. You can have some recall or understand level initially to test some aspects but all these should be aligned with your learning objectives and instructional strategies that you have done throughout the entire semester. Yeah, Sri Jayachandra College. Good evening madam. Uh, will you be discussing about, uh, uh, will you be discussing uh, course design on the basis of Washington Accord because many colleges are uh, required to design their curriculum on the basis of Washington Accord. Okay, so we won't be discussing that topic directly 
but what we have done so far in terms of being able to write learning objectives at different levels writing uh, assessment questions and aligning them to the learning objectives these form one major component of the washington accord there are other things in the washington accord that is how do you start with program educational objectives and then trickle it down to the course level and unit level that part we won't be discussing in this workshop but the part that the instructor as an individual can do that's something that we've already done in the last 3 days yeah kurukshetra university good evening sir good evening my name is punit bansal uh, i don't have a question i have a submission actually many i have seen that many teachers are concerned about the recognition from the government side uh, but uh, ugc is already uh, implementing all these techniques because uh, ugc has notified that by 2016 every college has to apply for nba accreditation and uh, these rubric course outcomes program outcomes all these are mentioned in the nba process so i, I hope this workshop will help all of you do that and uh, the goals of the workshop is to train a lot a large number of instructors to do that so that when it comes time for accreditation you're all ready to do that i'm strange question actually the uh, like leaders in ict like iits they are leading this uh, ict technique implementation in india from the front and this uh, seems strange that uh, like iit madras i have seen iit khadakpur i have seen they still use this Uh, like very traditional classrooms like chowk and this thing so okay so again i'm going to go back to the premise of this workshop we are not saying chowk is bad iit bombay also uses a lot of chowk i also use chowk when necessary we are not at the same time saying that ict will solve all problems what we are saying is depending on what all tools you have what uh, uh, at your disposal and what you choose to use how do you use it in the most effective manner that's the focus of the workshop so that's all we'll say about this but the tool itself is not what we are going to be talking about and not, not what we focus about jc college one more question yeah uh, madam can you give your ideas regarding uh, creating a question bank okay uh, a quick and easy way of creating question banks is already being uh, exposed to you wikis so supposing within your institution you have say 10 faculty in a particular domain they all can have individual wiki pages where they write the questions now uh, wiki is a collaborative tool wherein the others can also go and review these uh, give comments and the faculty himself or by him uh, herself can revise these questions so at the end of the day so at the end of say one iteration you will have a set of good questions for your domain now what we are trying to do in the et repository wiki if you look at it are uh, strategies to create repositories of good peer instruction and tps strategies so we will have uh, activities wherein you create and write tps activities in the wiki pages so this will be copied from your tps assignments you can just copy it from your tps assignments on to the wiki and this will be evaluated by a larger audience like for example if you are teaching computer science there may be uh, around 1000 odd teachers as part of t10 kt within the domain of computer science and they will all have ability to view your question and we'll provide you with rubrics as to how to assess these tps strategies so at the end of the day you will get reviews from 1000 people yeah so uh, basically if the if all the people use it you will get 1000 people but we are mandating that you review three people so at the minimum you will have three at the maximum you have thousands so this way once you refine these uh, contents this itself will become a good repository so and this is going to happen across the next two weeks so in the online phase uh, and also towards the end of the workshop so uh, can you please tell me the role of the rc coordinator during uh, this time now what should i do now uh, as rc coordinator what you have to now ensure is that all your participants have at least tried out the wiki for trial wiki which we have uh, created just for participants to get exposed to wiki so once all this is done you have to share the usernames of all your participants to us 
and we will add them to the T10KT repository whereby they will have access to all the T10KT repository resources that you create in wiki. University BDT college. Uh, madam, I got a two question. Uh, first one is if the quality of a student is below average, uh, the, the, these technologies uh, that is a flip loss and other things are uh, how much suitable, how much relevant. Uh, and second question is tomorrow is available for any queries and other things. Direct. Okay, I uh, will take your second query first regarding your assignment queries regarding your assignments and all you have to post in Moodle. So, there are specific forums for that you can even post in the news forum if you want. So, if there is a question already you just have to look at it what the response has been given to that question. So, if the response has already been said you will be redirected to that particular forum regarding your question number one. First of all it is it is not advisable that you slot your students into low achievers and high achievers. Yes, students will have some difficulties. So, what you have to try to do is I mean active learning strategies are one way in which you can bring them up in their level of expertise. So, uh, if you have a student who is a high achiever and you pair them up with a, a person who is having difficulty. So, let us say the think pair share example the higher achiever is going to explain it to the peer and he is going to receive it more openly as it is coming from his friend. And this will give you two things one is that the entire classroom environment will become more conducive for active learning strategies. Second is that you will see a remarkable improvement in the people whom you quote unquote call law achievers across the semester. And uh, this is not a magic pill. So, you do this once it may not give you the desired effect. You have to do it continuously across a semester to see that there has been changes in the student. I mean once when he entered the semester and once he is exiting the semester. That brings us to the end of the Q&A session.